There's probably no one thing in the past 10 years that has really impacted this community more than the tornado outbreak. 101 houses damaged, uh, 43 destroyed. It, it was very noisy and the, and, the, and the whole drive, the tornado was right on top of the building. It could look perfect outside and then within 30 minutes it's pitch black and just a nightmare is coming through and you don't know what's going to happen. We was watching the weather like everybody else. We knew that there was a possibility that this could happen and uh, this was the worst case scenario. I definitely still see it as a survivor because surviving is what we did. Um, and surviving has taught us how to handle difficult situations. Ten years ago today, right here in Henryville, this school collapsed and much of this town was wiped out by a monster EF4 tornado. It cut a path through southern Indiana and especially here in Henryville. Thanks for joining us for our special coverage, remembering March 2nd, 2012, 10 years later. I'm Chief Meteorologist Ben Pine. 11 people were killed in that tornado and even more in southern Indiana and Kentucky during that tornado outbreak. At the time, it was the strongest tornado I've ever tracked in my career. Today, we're remembering that deadly outbreak, but also the recent historic event in Kentucky, two tragedies a decade apart. But the outbreak of 2012 shows us that communities can rebuild and become even stronger than before. First though, let's recall the track of the deadly and destructive EF4. The EF4 was on the ground 49 minutes, covering 49 miles, traveling 60 miles per hour with maximum winds up to 170 miles per hour and took 11 lives. Many call it the Henryville tornado because of all the damage there. But the tornado moved over a handful of counties in southern Indiana, starting near Fredericksburg in southern Washington County as an EF1 at 2.50 p.m. The tornado quickly strengthens to an EF2, knocking down a high-tension power structure, then rips up pavement a few miles north of Palmyra. Now an EF3, 150 mile per hour winds, 200 yards wide. The tornado quickly moves east-northeast to Pekin, now an EF4, 170 mile per hour winds, nearly a half mile wide. The tornado there levels a factory, then shortly after kills five people in a mobile home. The tornado then travels north of Borden through Daisy Hill, leveling well-built homes and throwing cars and trucks around. It then travels through the Clark Memorial Forest, creating a half mile wide scar through the trees. Next up, Henryville at 3.15 p.m., heavily damaging the elementary school and hurling a school bus into a building across the street. Next, the tornado tears apart this church in northern Clark County and levels the Decker family home. Unfortunately, the tornado is still very strong, and at 3.26 p.m., just 36 minutes after it began, still an EF4 in Jefferson County, Indiana, several well-built brick homes destroyed, killing four people. The tornado crosses the Ohio River and weakens in Trimble County, and destroying mobile homes ends at 3.39 p.m., four miles north of Bedford, Kentucky. Henryville schools were released 20 minutes early that Friday because of the threat of severe weather. Students were loaded on buses and taken to a safer place, but one bus had to turn around. Everybody stay together, all our group together right now. Go, 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 go. That's bus driver Angel Perry talking to her 11 students after she decided to head back to the school. Students raced inside and were in the building when it was hit. Everyone inside survived. Storm Team Meteorologist Chelsea Smith talked with some of the students who took shelter as their school fell apart around them. It was 10 years ago today where Sam and Jackson right here were seeking shelter during an after school program while a tornado was ripping through their school. It went on for, it felt like forever. Pretty scary to know that like that happened and I was 50 feet from it just like in this little room, just pretty crazy. Sam Gillis and Jackson Bagshaw were seven-year-old second graders at Henryville Elementary School when the EF4 producing winds of 170 miles per hour struck their school around three in the afternoon. It got really loud and deafening. You could hear a bunch of stuff crashing and it got pitch black and like your ears started popping. Initially, the daycare took shelter in the bathrooms near the elementary portion of the school. After it was all over, that section entirely was like destroyed. 
Thankfully, teachers decided to move the students to an office in a different part of the building moments before the tornado hit. This is formerly the uh, elementary office. This is where the students that were here after school took shelter. If we had even like stayed in that bathroom, can't really say what would happen. Gillis and Bagshaw were among the first to see what was left of their school. We walked through the hallway and it was all just rubble and stuff. It was just, they were hanging wires, ceiling tiles, glass, steel. And we walked through there, we walked through the cafeteria, which was just basically ripped apart. And it was a parent's worst nightmare. Gillis's mom and dad were 20 minutes away in Jeffersonville, Indiana, with no way to reach their son. And he got about like a mile and a half away from the school and traffic was so bad, he pulled off to the side and got out and just ran the rest of the way, just trying to find me. Five to 10 minutes after the school was hit, the tornado was headed directly towards seventh grader Isaac Middleton's house, where he was taking shelter in his basement with his mom and two friends. It's incredible to hear your house being split into toothpicks, basically. Middleton says the first two floors of his tri-level home were destroyed or wiped out completely, with his room lying in the front yard. My house just, it's gone. We have no, nothing. We have nowhere to go. We're not sure what we're going to do. It's just a process that just keeps rolling in your mind. Now Gillis and Bagshaw are seniors getting ready to graduate, and Middleton, a first-time teacher at Henryville Junior and Senior High School. While 10 years have passed, the memories and impacts haven't. I still get scared over storms and all that, like really bad ones, but I've gotten better about it. It gave me anxiety problems, but I've learned to cope with it. Sometimes going to the elementary side, just like going to drop something off to a teacher, like pick up my sister, I'll stop for a second because I'll just get like a brief little flashback. Stay in there! Stay in! You're going to come out! And it only took about five months to restore the schools to get students back in for the next school year. I'm meteorologist Chelsea Smith, WHAS 11, on your side. Ten years later, the Clark County Indiana Museum in Jeffersonville is commemorating the storm, its aftermath, and what was learned from it. This new exhibit features photos and mementos from March 2nd, 2012. There's also an emphasis on weather safety in the hopes of preventing any more deaths from severe weather. The exhibit honors those who lost their lives or were injured, but also recognizes the good that came afterwards. We also have a lot of things to celebrate about this. The fact that over 12,000 people came here from every state in the union and seven different countries to help Southern Indiana. The fact that over $3 million was given to help rebuild. So there was much good that came out of a very painful situation. Many of those volunteers were people who experienced similar tragedies like Hurricane Katrina or the tornado in Joplin, Missouri. Mary Sullivan helped manage many of those who came to help through her work with the Metro United Way. To have it really in my own backyard and knowing people who were affected, uh, I was glad that I had the skills and the knowledge and the organization of Metro United Way to provide backing and support for all these people. The exhibit at the Clark County Indiana Museum will be open through the month of March. This anniversary comes less than three months after the historic and deadly tornado outbreak in Kentucky. One of those tornadoes traveled more than 200 miles from the far western part of the state up through Muhlenberg County. It devastated the towns of Mayfield, Dawson Springs, and Bremen. Other tornadoes hit Bowling Green and Campbellsville. Those in southern Indiana are part of a small group who can understand and relate to what the people in western Kentucky are currently going through. We asked them to give some advice to the people who are now rebuilding. Work together. You know, if, if the communities work together, the religious groups, the social service groups, the United Ways, the government agencies, everybody pools the resources and do, does it in a unified way, it'll go more, much faster and much better. There are so many wonderful people in the world who just love to help and will come forward with incredible gestures of money and volunteerism. And I think we have to really look for the good in people and the good that can come out of something this terrible. And it will, and it does. There is hope and hopefully they can find some shining star out of it, some bright light, some rainbow at the end of that storm uh, that they can find from that.
You just heard from Stephanie Decker, who became known across the country after she lost her legs while saving her children from the tornado. Ten years later, she's thriving, not just surviving. How she's using her experiences to now help others when we come back. Thanks again for joining us for our special coverage, remembering March 2nd, 2012, 10 years later. She became the most familiar face after the tornado outbreak. We're catching up now with Stephanie Decker. The tornado warning for South Central it's, Indiana. I watch a movie. It plays like a movie in my head. I can see it on the, on the screen. It doesn't necessarily, I don't live that movie, but I can see it and watch it. Stephanie Decker became a household name across Kentuckiana and the nation after her house literally fell on top of her. Ten years ago, when the EF4 was most fierce, she lost portions of both of her legs, sacrificing her own body to protect her two kids. But her legs weren't the only injuries after a second tornado came along on nearly the same path. That's what came at Reese's head, so I just used my torso to move in front of it, and that's what broke my ribs. Wow. Yeah. So that was coming to her head though. So that hit you? That hit me in the back. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. And it punctured the lung and broke eight ribs. And not to mention the golf ball size hail that left a scar on her head. She shared her incredible story of survival on network news and television shows and with the President of the United States. And to this day, never considered herself a victim. Nothing but great things have come into our life. We have a our home we love and we have my kids are well adjusted, they're happy, they're going on to college and, and doing all the things they want to do and that's what you want for your kids, that's what you want as a family. Her family is her passion along with motivational speaking and the Stephanie Decker Foundation, still helping children with prosthetics. The Stephanie Decker Foundation is probably one of the biggest bonuses. Um, it gives more to us than we could probably ever give it to it. I mean, it just warms our heart to be able to help kids that are missing arms and legs to be able to play sports or you know, even sponsor a kid to go to another camp if they want to. After 10 years, Stephanie says the prosthetics still prove to be a challenge. I was on the treadmill. My right leg, I have what's called a liner, and it actually has a vacuum seal. So when you lose that seal, you lose the vacuum. Well, the leg doesn't stay on. And so I'm running on the treadmill, and the whole thing flips, and I go flying off the back of the treadmill into the drywall. My foot is stuck in the drywall. So it's funny. I mean, I didn't get hurt. It was hilarious. My kid decided he wanted to move down here. Stephanie calls her basement Fort Knox, and her family is ready when severe weather strikes. She urges all of us to be well prepared and have a safety plan. All the emergency supplies we keep in here, anything medically, we keep water, we keep, you know, food, anything in case you get stuck. As you can tell, it's concreted all through with a steel front door, and you can't even hear it storm down here. Stephanie says surviving March 2nd, 2012 gave her family the power to push through any of life's future storms. What the tornado has taught us is that your difficult times are always going to be there. It's just kind of how you handle those difficult times is what's going to get you through. Um, and, and that's really all we can do. I mean, it's just, you know, what else, uh, the other option is really not an alternative. You know, you can't sit there and feel sorry for yourself um, because life goes on whether you do or not. Uh, so we just choose to kind of move forward with it and find the best out of it. The storm left a mark on people's lives, but also the environment. This is an image of the Clark Memorial Forest between Borden and Henryville in August 2010. Now look at September 2014. Even two years after the storm, you can see the half mile wide tornado scar left behind where the trees were destroyed. That scar remained in this satellite image even in 2020 and impacts can be seen today. Speaking of forests, some people believe forests can block tornadoes from developing, but is there any truth to that? Our storm team meteorologist Alden German debunks five tornado myths. Don't let this winter coat fool you. Tornado season will be here soon, and along with it, misconceptions about how they work. Myth number one, tornadoes don't hit major cities. False. Oklahoma City 99, Salt Lake City, Miami, Cincinnati, uh, St. Louis, a big tornado before 1900, went right into St. Louis, killed a lot of people, totally false. 
Although rare, it does happen and can happen to any city in a region prone to tornadoes, including Louisville. 1890, a F4 tornado uh, came in and hit the city, killed a lot of people, actually hit the water tower up on Zern Avenue. 74 went through Louisville, uh, the April 3rd, 74, that's the one hit Brandenburg. What about lakes and rivers? Those disrupt tornadoes, right? In general, uh, no, no. Tornadoes cross bodies of water. If you want to call it a water spout for a moment, but yeah, they do. They do. They definitely do. Uh, in the middle of winter, it's possible there is some effect. One study in Alabama showed indications that very cold water might disrupt low level instability needed for tornadoes, but more studies are needed to confirm that. Another common myth is that hilly and forested areas prevent tornadoes because they disrupt the wind flow. March 2nd, which we're honoring in this special, uh, went through West Liberty and Cyrusville and all across Eastern Kentucky. A lot of the locals, you know, the myths we're doing, Alton, a lot of the locals believe that the hills and mountains of Eastern Kentucky would save them. And that obviously was not true because that thing, those two went on the ground for miles and miles and miles across those big hills. For most tornadoes, this myth is false. The tornado that hit Henryville first ripped a path through Clark Memorial Forest. May 28, 1996 saw an F4 tornado rip through Jefferson Memorial Forest. That said, very small, weak tornadoes may have a harder time in densely forested regions. Myth number four, if you're on a highway and see a tornado, stop, get out of your car, and take shelter under a bridge. Overpasses are very dangerous. There is no safety in there. It actually increases the wind speed. We actually spin up and increase as you get under there. And people literally in 1999 in Oklahoma City were mauled to death, impaled to death. Don't do that. An overpass is one of the most dangerous places anyone can be in the event of a tornado. Never do it. This myth started after amateur video of a Kansas tornado in 1991 showed people taking shelter under an overpass. Those people were fortunate. That particular tornado was weak and the overpass didn't take a direct hit. Finally, tornado sirens are the best way to be alerted to a tornado. False. Sirens are meant to alert people outside, not indoors. Inside noises can easily drown out the sound of a siren, some of which may be miles away. Instead, have a NOAA weather radio handy, watch local TV stations such as WHAS 11, or you can download the free WHAS 11 app to get alerts sent straight to your phone. Reporting in Louisville, meteorologist Alden German, WHAS 11, on your side. It's something we've heard from everyone who survived the tornado outbreak. Be prepared. Any day that you expect severe weather and it's focused on your location, that's when you need to find your tornado shelter. We're breaking down the steps you can take now to be ready when severe weather hits when we come back. When it comes to severe weather, flooding and tornadoes are the biggest killers, with straight line wind and lightning at a lower threat. It's important to remember severe weather, including tornadoes, can happen any month of the year, and we always need to be ready and have a safety plan in place. We do, however, see a higher number of tornadoes in March, April, May, and June. Storm Team Meteorologist Reed Yaden shares how we can best be prepared. Once a tornado warning is issued, now it's time for action. It's time to put your prearranged plan into place. Here's a few things to remember. The lowest level of house, ideally a basement. Now, where are you going to go in the basement? In this particular case, we choose a bathroom here. The reason is it has walls on all sides of you. There's less debris to come caving in on you. Provides another element of safety. Under a staircase also works very well. There are numerous areas in the basement. The idea is to select one and have your prearranged plan. In an unfinished basement, find something sturdy to get under, such as shelving or a workbench. If you don't have a basement, an interior room of the house, such as a closet, will provide added safety. When you get up in the morning and you watch the morning news and they're talking about severe weather expected later in the day, clean out the closet so that you can get in there. You don't have to pull things out. Pre-planning should include putting together a storm safety kit, some items to include, battery operated phone charger, first aid kit, LED flashlights, a weather radio. This model from Midland even has a flashlight. Information is vital during severe weather. If electricity is out or cable and satellite down, as long as you have a cell service, you can watch WHAS 11 as we stream live across multiple platforms. If cell service is lost, 
The weather radio is your best source for information. Another concern during severe weather relates to mobile homes. Kentucky Emergency Management Meteorologist Joe Sullivan says residents of mobile homes need to have an alternate location to seek shelter. Some, uh, some communities have church basements, others have tornado shelters, but the time to go is not when the warning has been issued for your area. You need to really sort of ramp up your, uh, your situation awareness in that case, and I would strongly recommend it if you're living in a mobile home, especially at night, go there and uh, be there about an hour beforehand. Don't wait until the warning is issued. I'm sitting here right now in the ultimate tornado protection. This is an underground fiberglass shelter. And since December, a local dealer here says business has been brisk. The four person model I'm in was installed by Kentucky Storm Shelters in Campbellsville. Owner Paul Gabehart says business exploded after the December outbreak. It got to the point where I couldn't even answer the phone any longer. Uh, I had to rely on text and email. Uh, I, I physically couldn't talk any longer. The underground shelters are made of fiberglass, above ground shelters constructed of steel. Gabehart says 80% of his sales are underground models, ranging in size from four to 20 person capacity. We can get the smaller units in, in typically two to four hours, and some of the bigger units uh, can take us up to six. So let's suppose a tornado had moved through the area you went to your shelter, you come out now, you look around, you're certainly safe, your family's safe. There's the shelter. You can look around, your home could be gone, but the main thing is you're safe. I leave my back door and get in the shelter and I know that my husband and my animals are safe. Reed Yaden, WHAS 11 News on your side. Thanks for joining us for our special coverage, remembering March 2nd, 2012, 10 years later, and be safe this coming severe weather season. On behalf of the First Alert Storm Team, I'm Chief Meteorologist Ben Pine, WHS 11, on your side.